So tonight we're joined by Andy Ross, who's uh, well known in the Northeast for his uh, dealings with all sorts of Twilight Zone type items. Most notably, I came across Andy um, talking about something called the Durham Puma, which I wasn't too aware of, and he's uh, going to give us some insight into that. Uh, welcome, Andy. All right, Al, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. And uh, yeah, it, it, I, I first came across you, um, I suppose it'd be a few years back now, uh, dealing with aliens, but uh, not all aliens apparently are extraterrestrials. Um, we've got something called alien big cats in the UK, referred to as the Durham Puma. Um, how, how did that come about in the UK? What, what caused that situation? Where did, where did these things come from, if indeed they do exist? Going back in history, there has been reports and yeah, sightings of these big cats. Um, it started to become more widespread in about uh, the 1970s, um, when the Wild Acts, yeah, Wild Animals Act was brought in. The, the Dangerous um, Wild Animals Act, yeah, that one. D- Dangerous Wild Animals Act, yeah. When uh, Before then, I mean, there was a magazine called uh, Exchange of Mart. Uh, you could buy. Bang, it was amazing. Going, that's, what... that's going back a bit, isn't it? Exchange of Mart. <laughs> it, it is. It is. It's, uh, <laughs> but it, in there, you could buy exotic animals, uh, snakes, uh, snakes, tigers, lions. You name it, you could buy it out of that magazine. And the government realised there was a problem and they brought in this way, uh, Dangerous uh, Animals Act to more or less licence who people who, who had it. With the big cats, it was said that when this licence was brought in, there was a lot of cats released into the wild because people didn't want to licence them and go through the hassle of getting the licences. So it was, so were people just having these things around the houses then? You know, when you walk in someone's house, there'd be a, a tiger in, in the living room or, or, or what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there would be tiger. It's just the tiger just sitting there. Um, it was sort of like a a status a status symbol. I mean, like today with the you know the the, the American pit bull, the dogs and that sort of how that's some a sort of status symbol. I mean, the dog get us, don't get us wrong. The dogs, the dogs are not sort of if they're handled right. The dogs are not vicious. It's just people who've got them. Some of the people who've got them and yeah, not the best people to have them. Right, it, was, it was similar so. to them. Yeah, it was similar to them. I mean, there was a a one a story of a, a fire. It happened in London in the sixties or seventies, and the fire brigade went in to, to sort of do this fire and broke the door down. <laughs> in the flat was a tiger sitting there. Wow! Can you imagine, yeah. can you imagine being the fireman first through the door there with the horse? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, but, I know cats don't like uh, water, but you know, but, I'd want a bit more than a hose if I went in through a door and there was a big tiger just sat yeah. there. Especially, yeah, definitely, definitely. Especially if it was hungry. Yeah, true. <laughs> so, but, yeah. I mean, would you? I mean, would, would you see them? People take them for walks, like dogs and things, or? Yeah, I mean, if, if you do search on the internet, you do see uh, photos, older photos, where there's people walking these, the the tigers and that, and. Uh, by pumas in in the street, uh, it's, it's, it's quite uh, unusual, yeah, un- weird to see, but it, it did happen. It um, puts a different spin on someone shouting for tiddles at the, the back door, doesn't it? To come in, yeah, 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 it does, it does. So I mean, you know, I suppose quite rightly, then the, the government decided, hang on, pal, we can't have this any longer. Um, so the the, the wild, wild animals act, then, and um, we'll just call it that for now. It's easier than the yeah. full title. Um, that brought in a lot of licensing requirements, didn't it? Part of the licensing was about basically keeping the people around you safe and the community safe. Um, yeah, yes. So yeah. people having to put all these extra security measures in, obviously that would cost a lot of money. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not cheap to keep animals anyway, is it? You know, you, no, no. Even the, the sort of little tabbies we've got now, it's, you know, get some vet bills in for those, they can skyrocket. Um, so... What were the options that people had? They either sort of stumped up the money and, and paid for what needed paying, or they, they just sort of quietly let them loose into the night. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you you could stump up the money for the license. You you could sort of try and find a zoo or um, somewhere what would take them. Also, sadly, the other other option was they just uh, let them go. I mean, it's like to the day when uh, people can't look after the dogs. They just take them, replace, and dump the dogs and leave them. It was the same with them; just took them, 
somewhere and just dump them. Yeah, it's uh, just, it's quite scandalous in this day and age that people do that, but uh, I suppose back yeah. then people's values were a bit different. Yeah, yeah. So it, does this tend to be a regional thing, or is it countrywide? Or it's it is countrywide. Um, the, I mean, the years tales all the way across. I mean, uh, probably one of the most famous one would be uh, the Beast of Bodmin, Beast of Bodmin Moor, um, which. Has uh, been sightings way back in uh, the nineteen seventies. So would that predate this this Wild Animals Act then? Just it probably would have just uh, predated it. Um, and I mean, in fact, when I was at school, there was um, a book we were reading a book in English, uh, The Runaways, by Victor 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 Cannons, and that was written in nineteen seventy two, and that tells the story of. Um, uh, a young lad who's run away yeah, from Borstal and he his path crosses with a cheetah on, uh, on by in fact the Salisbury's plane and th- th- this book was written, written in 72 and I would teach her when she was when we're reading the book she was saying that was sort of because there had been reports like like the Bodman piece of Bodman and it was sort of like uh, this uh, Victor Cannon's had written a story based on around it so the, uh, this is potentially not necessarily people dumping them because of this this act came in then if they've been uh, no. around for for much longer than that yeah yeah wait um i mean i know some people say that um, there was also a dumping back in the, the second world war when again people had them ha- had them as pests their pets but the uh, supply of meat was hard to get so they just they dumped them then because their meat was rationed and they didn't have the uh, facilities to feed the animals, so they just let them go then. Which I mean, I've only heard that a couple of times um, mentioned. So whether it was or not, but with these bigger states, uh, it was sort of like a, a novelty item to have something like that around. So it, it could well have been. I seem to remember something in a Sherlock Holmes book as well about um, an eccentric ar- aristocrat. Having all sorts of wild animals on his estate as well, so I suppose that would fit in. You know, that would be back ooh, in the in the eighteen hundreds as well. So it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this this yeah. is something that does go back a long way. Um, yes, yeah. For for those people who uh, maybe doubt that, you know, we're what 40, forty years on from the Wild Animals Act, and people are saying that, um, you know, we oh, we wouldn't have the breeding pairs to sustain a population. Well, you know, m- maybe we do. Maybe there is uh, that that wet width in the gene pool for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't take many. I mean, I, I suppose if you had one male and five or six females, or two males and five or six females, the gene pool wouldn't be that diluted. It wouldn't be that sort of interbred. Yeah. Because the, the, a male would yeah, wander miles in search of a female. So, uh, so t- t- talk about on the wonder then. Uh, have you got any sort of examples of, of sightings? Uh, across the country, or um, there's a, a lot of sightings across the country. Yeah, uh, like say, but yeah, one uh, There was one seen on the outskirts of London. There, uh, I'm certain that was a couple of months ago. Um, somebody walking with there yeah, with this lockdown, that and people getting out, sort of being out and walking and being more quiet. There'd been a sighting there, and then you, you work further down the country. Yeah, uh, Yorkshire's got them. Um, in fact, there was a news report. A couple of, yeah, I think it was yeah, two or three weeks ago in the paper. Oh, hold on, I think I've got the paper here somewhere. I seem to remember something quite recently about um, a lady out walking a dog, and the dog went yeah. flat on the ground, and she looked up and saw a large brown-looking um, cat um, walking in front of a wall or something, and then it hopped over the yeah. wall and, and disappeared. It hopped over the wall and disappeared, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that, that must be quite fright, a frightening experience, then, really. It, it it would be, yeah, yeah. I mean to say that. Um, the only thing is, um, with with them, they're usually sort of trying to get out the way. If they see a person, they try and get out the way of them. So usually, when a person sees them, the cat's already seen seen that person long before the person has, and the per, the cat's sort of making its way away from them. Because they are shy animals. 
I mean, you, you mentioned yeah. about sightings in Yorkshire. Um, back end of August, I was down at Bempton um, in, I think that's East Yorkshire. Is it East Yorkshire or North Yorkshire? I think it might be East Yorkshire. Uh, East right, Yorkshire. Right on the coast there. And yeah. apparently the week beforehand, there'd been a some sort of sighting um, near the clifftops down there of a, a large black cat. Um, yeah. And, you know, looking around at, at first sort of look, you'd think, well, you know, it's it's mainly agricultural land there. And, you know, at this time of year uh, where crops are being harvested, you know, there's there's not much cover. But then if you, if you actually look in a little bit more detail, I, I thought, well, if I was going to hide, where would I hide? And there's actually plenty of cover around if you look for it. You know, if, if you're prepared <laughs> to get right down on the ground and, you know, you, you could actually sit there and watch people go by and they would never know you were there. Uh, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I, I, I do. I do think it's quite, quite a reasonable proposition that these things are out and about, and they see us long before we see them. But yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Doctor, I mean, the report I was on about it's uh, Doctor uh, Horman, Andrew Horman from uh, the Royal Agricultural University in uh, Sarinchester. He he came out. He says there's about two hundred and fifty black yeah leopards about, and two hundred and fifty pumas, uh, in, in the wild. And that's all the way from from the south, right way down. The only thing I would sort of question about is they come all the way down, and then the northeast of England's just totally missed. They do not mention any of the sightings in the northeast of England. Yeah, uh, well, that's fa- fairly typical for national studies, isn't it? it you know, if, if, they, if they go north of Birmingham, they, they end up in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, true. Well, in fact, right way from there's a cut off point, sort of like Cumbria. Mix, miss all the northeast, then into Scotland, and the northeast and Scotland that has a lot of sightings, uh, big cats and that. Because I mean, I, I would, I would have said Scotland certainly. I mean, in, in the Highlands, I mean that's, and the, uh, the, the Trossachs, um, you know, that's absolutely fantastic country. You can, you can go walking and not see anyone all day. Um, yeah. But if you, if, I suppose, if you think about a little bit further south, places like Kielder Forest in in Northumberland, would be. Yeah. A pretty good habitat for them, I would imagine. It, it would be an excellent uh, habitat for them. Uh, there's plenty of deer, uh, the road deer, and that. Uh, there's, there's plenty, plenty of places for them to get sheltered, hide, and stuff like that. It, it would be great. And I mean, all the way across Northumberland, you've got great places in Northumberland, down into Durham, like I said, with the the sightings of the Durham, the, the Durham puma. Uh, that's all the way around Durham. It has been sightings of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I spent, or I used to spend quite a bit of time in the Durham Dales, Weardale and Teesdale. And yeah. um, again, you, you sort of look over and think, well, a lot of this is moorland. And it, it does seem very wide open and windswept, for want of a better word. Um, yeah. But once you get up on those hills, you start going off the roads and off um, traditional tracks or trails. It's it's quite difficult to move through that because of the the, the level of the gorse and all the bushes and things, and again, yes. gr- great hunting cover if if something's out looking for rabbits or or that type of, of size of creature for for a male. But I, I'm intrigued. I mean, the the reason why I contacted you was I'm intrigued by this this Durham puma. I mean, Durham right on my doorstep. Uh, yes, and I don't really know a lot about it. I've heard I've heard obviously heard the title mentioned. And there's been the odd sort of tongue-in-cheek news report that I've seen either in the press or on TV. But uh, what, what can you tell me about the Durham Puma then? Yeah, well, the Durham Puma. I mean, the the main sightings really uh, sort of what started to get reported uh, started happening in about the 1980s, 1984. Um, there was a in eighty two or eighty three. The government passed a law where there had to be a, a each police force. Had to have a, a wildlife officer. Really, they're looking at sort of a rural policing specialist. Yes, yeah, and each area had to have one. And the Durham area had two. There was one Eddie Bell, and for the life of me, the other one's gone for the moment. But I'll see if I can find his name. Uh, but anyway, Eddie Bell was one of them, and he had the Durham area. And one of his first investigations was in 1984 at a farm at Chincliffe when uh, there'd been a report of a cow, cow a calf, that had been attacked. And I, su- and I suppose we should explain 
to the listeners where Shincliffe is. I mean, Durham City's in the northeast of England. It's the, the county, yeah. ta- county town of the predictably named County Durham. And yeah. Shincliffe's kind of on the, what, southeastern edge it, it, of Durham City? It's a little village just, it, just outside there? Yeah, it is about a mile and a half southeast of um, Durham City itself. And again, it's really on the verge of urban environment and a very rural environment on that side as well, isn't it? It is. Once, wait, once you get out of uh, Durham City, um, the amount of rural area it is, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, don't tell say. anyone. Don't tell anyone. We don't want to be overrun with tourists. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. It's uh, one of the best kept secrets. <laughs> but um, he'd been called out of this farm uh, in Shincliffe. Uh, a farmer had gone out to check on the morning there uh, because you, you check your cattle sort of morning and afternoon to make sure everything's okay. Sort of first thing in the morning, so if anything's happened during the night, you can uh, sort it out. And on the afternoon, so just before it's starting to get dark, if there's anything needs doing, you can get it sorted. I should so, jump in there and mention that uh, you are actually a farmer, so you, you're an expert in that field as well. <laughs> yeah, wait, well, I would have come to that because, if, in fact, the farm where it was, uh, years later, I, I started working there, and in fact, I'm still working there now. And um, I was told this by uh, the farm manager who worked there at the time. But then, years later, Eddie Bell was doing a talk at Hamsley, and he mentioned about this farm and said the exact same story. It's been called out to, uh, the, the calf. On the night time when he checked, the calf was okay. Then when he went in the next morning, the calf was down by the side of the road, there uh, the wood. It, it something tried to pull it through the fence. And um, so Eddie Bell came out to check and he says, look, he says, it could be in poachers trying to get it away. He says, but the marks on it, he says, I'm not too sure about it. He says, do you mind if we get sent away and get checked? So he sent it away. Yeah, they, they sent it to the vets, got it checked and that. But it, it came back uh, inconclusive. But um, Daddy Bell thought it could well have been a, a attack, a cat attack. So did did they mention what type of injuries this calf had? I mean, I would imagine if if someone's tried, someone or some things try to drag it through a fence. Um, ca- calves aren't light things, are they? They're, they're quite. They might be little compared to full size cattle, but they're, they're still quite hefty beasts to move. Yeah, the, well, I mean, a calf, uh, even a newborn calf, uh, between thirty five and forty five kilos, which is uh, just short of eight stone. I'm pleased you did the conversion there because I, I I can't work in kilos. I was trying to desperately work it out in my head. <laughs> a little bit about seven, yeah, seven, seven and a half stone there. Mm-hmm. Then, uh, so it, it, they're not they're not like things. They're not. So this, but this had been dragged. Wait, in fact, it hadn't been dragged. It'd been carried from the top of the field down to the bottom. There was no thingy marks, but then it got to the fence and it looked like it'd been something you tried to drag it through the fence. Yeah, I would, have thought, it, I would have thought if it had been poachers, though, they would have lifted it over the fence. I mean, they wouldn't have tried to drag it through. They would have had the sense not to do that. No, they would have, they would have taken it uh, over the fence. And, in fact, the way they went, if they were poachers, they wouldn't have took it that way because um, you're going through thick wood uh, and scrubbing that. And then the next next stop is the riverbank. I find it quite intriguing, though, um, that they said that was inconclusive. I would have thought... I mean, it would be unlikely to be a dog. I think it'd have to be a whacking great big dog yeah. to do that. Dog, yeah. Um, but I, as I understand it, when big cats attack the prey, they go for the area of the neck. For They're the on the neck area, yeah. And the, yeah. rather than rip the prey to bits, they, they try and get a bite on the neck to choke them and then sever the yeah. the spinal cord. Good. Yeah. Is that is that correct? It, yes, yeah. Um, they'll sort of do it that way, yeah, and then try and take it away and eat it in a bit more safety. So, any, uh, any other sightings around the Durham area then? Yeah, quite a few. And in fact, um, like I said, I mean, um, that happened in '84. Uh, I started working in '90. I was a middle year student there, and 
it wasn't until I went back in 94, 95 that I started to tell uh, my workmates of my interest in the, in the subject and in the subject of the paranormal. And Ian, who I was working with, he told us of uh, three, two what happened to him, one what happened to his friend. Uh, him, him, his friend, him and two friends were up shooting rabbits over Tamsley Forest just on the outskirts of Amsley Forest, and they used to go up there lamping on a night. Uh, they had permission of the the landowner. Uh, was doing them a favour, getting rid of the the, the rabbits. Bit, bit of anyway, this one, yeah, yeah. Th- this one night they were up there hunting. Um, I'm forgetting this uh, lady's name, but Helen had a gun. Uh, Ian was on the lamp, and as they were going around, Ian could sort of start to sense as though something was. Every time he turned the light. A certain way it was all there was something just keeping out the way of the light and this happened all the way around and he was st- it was starting to unnerve him so he said to helen he says oh look helen there uh, do you want to go on the lamp and i'll take over on the gun so he says we carried on a bit and he says we came sort of came around the field and he says we're he- headed back to the car he says because nothing much was happening then when it was he says they were sitting at, at the car Having a drink and that cup of tea, a yeah, bite eating. Yeah, it was. Stephen said that he felt uneasy in the field, and Ian and Helen says, "Yeah, I, he says they all felt as though something was watching them, following them." And I mean, Ian said, "He says, well, that's the reason I took the gun off you." He says, "Because I thought if something comes out of there, he says I don't want you sort of panic and uh, shooting everybody." He says, "I thought I'd take the gun off you." He says, "Because I know." If it suddenly come out there, he says, I, I know I was going to shoot it. Um, but anyway, he was the, the farm owner came out and they were talking and they were saying about this. And he says, Oh, wait, he says, That wood, so he says, Always been uneasy. I felt always felt uneasy in there. My dad said there was something not right in that wood. He says, But also, we heard a manor house just near them. And in the 70s and 60s and 60s to the 80s, there was a gangster uh, from Newcastle supposed to have had it. Or oh, right, he, okay. Don't mention any names. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the name. So, yeah. uh, but he, he was connected with something in Newcastle and that, and he's supposed to have had a as a protection. He's supposed to have had a couple of uh, leopards or something or cats. Well, within the, the next change from geese, it, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Within the sort of boundary fence, he had one fence, and then there was a sort of a boundary, and there was another fence, and these were supposed to be running All right, around okay. there, like a double perimeter. Yeah. A double perimeter fence, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the first story. The second one he said was again he was up at Tamsley, and he took he just getting a new scope. So he sort of thought, oh, you go up there, uh, Tamsley, yeah, zero to the, the scope in. And so they, because he could pick a field with good backdrop. So he went up the field, uh, what he was going to go into, and he sort of, he's looking. And as he's sort of looking around, he noticed there's cows in the field, so he thought, oh, I can't go in there. But as he went, so he, he was just sort of quickly looking through the scope, and he saw sitting, in the middle of the cows, the cows weren't bothering it. It wasn't bothering the cows. He says he sat and looked through the scope, and he says he could see the shape. He says the tufty ears. He was looking at a wildcat up there, and he says <laughs> I suppose it was really just, just perusing the menu, really, wasn't it? <laughs> it, it, it well, he said the, the cows weren't bothered about it, and it wasn't bothered about the cows, and it was just sitting there on the stump. And he says he watched it for a good, good few minutes. And uh, then it he sort of just thought, right, I better. He said, he said at the time when he saw it, he was tempted to uh, load the gun and take a shot at it. But he says he's glad now he didn't. He says because that that could have been the one of only one around the area, and it would have been a total waste if he'd had taken it out. Yeah, just a shame there weren't cameras available back then where he could have yeah. loaded that. Yeah, taking a photo and getting into that. Yeah. Uh, and I, then the, I suppose we should also make clear that this was on private land. It wasn't uh, within Hampstead Forest, uh, which is this, this was, owned and ma- managed by Forestry England, as it's called now. I was thinking of the yeah, Forestry yeah. Commission, but it did, I think it's Forestry England yeah. now. 
Yeah, it was it was in private land. It wasn't. It's it's just on the outskirts of the the forest, but it's it is private land he was on, not uh, the forest commission land. What, what about up in the Dales then? Have, have you got any sightings from up there? Way, Way Dale, Te- uh, Teasdale. I mean, again, uh, they're, they're they're two very um, rural areas. I, I was thinking of, of Teasdale as the the tourist Dale, as you were, and Weardale more the um, former industrial Dale with all the fluor spar mines and lead mines up there. Yeah, well, I mean, up, up that way, the years, um, oh, what's the, the uh, Killip, Killip Lead Mine, there has been sightings up there. Um, and working further down, you've got, um, I know it's just on the, the border. Heading over the top towards Nent Head. Yeah, there have been sightings over there. I've only had one personal experience of eye shine um, at night. Again, I was on a, a country road. It was a, a single track road. And I didn't know the road well. I'd gone down it because I'd never driven it before. So I yeah, I have this habit of, of going to places that I've not driven to before and, and checking out where the roads go and, and seeing what I can find. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'd gone down this road. Uh, and because I didn't know it, I was only doing 15 miles an hour tops. And all of a sudden, about 40 rabbits came running across the road at full speed. Now, you know how, how when a, a rabbit will run out in front of a car, look at the car, and then stop. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's, it's almost as though they're going, well, what are you doing here, sort of thing. Um, yeah. All of these rabbits, and I've never seen so many rabbits move at the same time in my life, right. um, yeah. all belted yeah. straight across the road. And, of course, I, I got the fright of my life, slammed my brakes on. <laughs> and um, anyway, they disappeared they came from my left, going over the road, off over to the right. They disappeared in the, in the other the hedgerow and beyond. Right, yeah. And once I'd sort of gathered my thoughts um, after, after the, the fright, I sort of looked to my left and I saw a bit of amber eye shine. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. But it looked to be about six foot off the ground. And the field to my left was raised up from the road right. um, because yeah. uh, of just the topology of the land. Yeah. And I kind of wrote that off as being an owl maybe, but I, I then sort of later on I, I kind of questioned, you know, would it would an owl hunting at night really cause uh, adult rabbits to flee in such great numbers? I, I suppose maybe they could, I, I don't know. Or, um, you know, m- maybe it was a fox up a tree or... Could it have been yeah. the Durham Puma? I don't. I don't know. Uh, it could have, could well have been there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, for the rabbits to run like that, it is sort of that something's chasing it, chasing them. And I mean, an owl, an owl sort of usually, if it if it's swooping nine times a day, you, you won't hear it, and the the rabbits and that wouldn't hear it because they are that quiet. It's amazing how that quiet. It could have been a fox, like you say, sat up in a tree, and the rabbits may have gotten a may have gotten the smell of it, may have gotten a scent scent of it. But for them to run like that, it's a bit bit weird. Yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of convinced myself because bear in mind this is way out in the country, so at night yeah. it was pitch black. There was just my headlights, and that was it. And I, yeah. man- I managed to convince myself it was just a, a, a fairly large owl sitting in the tree, um, just, yeah, just yeah. to stop my shaking and and. To get off and away and, and back onto a road I knew, but uh, sure. that's the only time I've ever experienced eye shine. And I, I always thought, should I should I have ever told anyone? I mean, if someone has a, a big cat sighting, uh, what should they do? Is is there any sort of official body that they're supposed to report it to? I mean, I, I felt fairly stupid for months mentioning my sort of eye shine incident to anyone. If but if someone genuinely sees a big cat in the wild, um other than running off to the press, I mean, what should they do? Should, is it a police matter, or would they not be interested? Uh, the, the police probably wouldn't be interested, but you could still report it to the police, and then at least it is being logged. The, the biggest problem is, I mean, like myself, yeah, I, I could collect reports and that, uh, and so like, people tell us of their reports, but that sort of may, I've got them reports, uh, there'll be other people around the area who sort of got reports so like um last year after i did when well, after i did the talk at uh, weed weekend um i 
I had another, say, 15, 20 reports uh, came in. Um, and was that just people approaching you after the talk or they'd, they'd seen the video online? Or? Uh, no, um, a couple of people approached us afterwards. Um, after the talk, a uh, lady from Hamsley uh, approached us and her uh, boyfriend and members of uh, Lapas and myself did a investigation up in, the, in Hamsley and then we, we put a request out on uh, Facebook if anybody had seen anything uh, around the Hamsley area and um, we got a few reports from there and uh, a few uh, some with messages on Facebook itself some with private messages which some people don't want the names of released but like I say it was uh, 15 or 20 new reports came came from that that, that, and that's quite a few, really, then, isn't it? it? It is. I mean, these some reports were. It's happened in the last couple of years. Some went back, so sort of 15, 20 years. But there was, let's say, six or seven of them. It's happened in the last five years. And I also did one on another group uh, I'm a member of. Uh, this was sort of a personal one. And again, I had a few reports from there. And two of them, it just happened the end of last year and the beginning of this year just just before we went into lockdown so with the lockdown and that uh, one of them I, I couldn't get to have an investigation of and the other one um the one in november i was hoping to get a chance to go to that one but it was on private land and the farmer whose land it is he doesn't want anybody snooping around and that uh, he gets too many problems at the moment he, he, he has too many problems with people on the land anyway they uh, poaching and that uh doing stuff what they shouldn't be so he, he doesn't want anybody else and i suppose he's, he's got biosecurity to think of as well i suppose so it, yes, I mean, that, yes. that is understandable i mean i, I would never never criticize a, a farmer who's i mean he's just trying to earn a living at the end of the day um, <laughs> they are, yeah. by denying yeah. access to people you, you know you, you don't really want people tromping around willy-nilly so, no, I've, I've had my sighting. I've seen a big cat. Um, I phoned the police. They've said, yeah, okay, thanks for the report. Um, realistically, I have no idea what the police could do. They're not, they're not going to call out a massive search to try and try and track the thing down. Um, no. They've got enough on the plates. Anyway, um, people like yourselves, I mean, what, what's, what's the best thing to do there? I mean, it's, I suppose... I suppose the the first thing is, you know, would would people's reports be taken seriously, and are, are they just going to get mocked about them? Or, um, that that's to say, I mean, they like myself. I mean, I'm a member of a, a paranormal group which would investigate different things, and the big cat sightings is one of the uh, Twilight World's paranormal group. And so, the one so thing, how, how could I get in touch with that group? That's what I'm asking, really. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Twilight World's Paranormal Group, uh, you could get in touch with them. We have a forum on the p- Facebook page. If you search uh, Twilight World's Paranormal Research Group, you will find it. We did used to have a number what you could people could get in touch with, but uh, that turned out we got we got a fair few crank calls, uh, people. Yeah, I suppose it takes a lot more effort to, to type something in than it does to pick up a phone and say, oh, I've, yeah. I've seen a, a leopard driving a UFO sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, or if... So let, let, yeah, let, I mean, let's just make that one clear then. Twilight Worlds on Facebook. Yes, Twilight Worlds Paranormal Research Society. And pe- um, people I'm, won't be ridiculed, yeah. they won't be mocked. Uh, the, no, they won't the, be the, the report will be taken seriously and... You know, they'll, they'll they'll have someone to talk it through with. They will do, yeah, yeah. Um, nationally, a good a good group to get in touch with nationally would be CFZ, uh, Centre for Frontier Zoology, which is run by Jonathan Downs and Richard Freeman. All right, okay, that would be yeah. that would that would be a good one to get in touch with uh, nationally. Uh, but I mean, at the moment, I don't think there is a national organization which is keeping a full track of everything every report whereas probably cs said is probably the closest to something like that 
Fabulous. Well, thanks very much for your time, Andy. That's That's been uh, an informative chat. Um, hope I haven't uh, taken up too much of your Sunday night. No, no, that, no problem with that. It's been quite interesting. It's been a nice chat. And uh, perhaps we can do this again and may- maybe talk about a bit more on the paranormal side because I don't, I don't know a lot about that either. So uh, we might delve, yes. delve into that next time round. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you like. If, if, uh, yeah, you could do. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Andy. Appreciate it.